the United States is taking steps to ban TikTok. Now, governments across Europe are following suit by insisting that the Chinese-owned app is removed from all the phones of all government officials. What exactly is it they're so worried about? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Philip Hampshire. TikTok is beloved by teenagers across the globe, but for an increasing number of politicians, it's off limits. Governments across the West are demanding officials delete it from their devices over fears that Chinese spies could use the information it gathers. The US government is going even further and is threatening a national ban on the app, in the same way as India already has. But China says fears of espionage are unfounded, and the bans are politically motivated. Let's see what our guests think. Here in the studio, we have Gavin Miller, who's a Deputy Chief Technology Officer at Tenable. In the studio, we also have Ross Brewer, who's the Chief Revenue Officer of SimSpace, a provider of military-grade cyber equipment. And connecting to us remotely from Beijing, we have Aina Tangen, who's a Senior Fellow at the Taiha Institute, an independent think tank based in China. So, Gavin, if we can start with you, um, what is it about TikTok that is causing all of this argument and furore right now? Yeah, so I think it comes down to, from a cybersecurity perspective, two main areas. It's the data sovereignty and the privacy of that data. So from a, a sovereignty perspective, and what's really got people concerned is uh, China, uh, Chinese engineers um, could be coerced to get data of users in America and in Europe, and that data could then be used to build um, dossiers on users in, the, in those countries, which you know, could lead to coercion, could lead to you know, further uh, issues um, uh, you know, and state-based uh, attacks. The other piece is the privacy uh, uh, component, where the data that's actually collected is you know, very verbose. There's a lot of data there. It's things like what people are watching, and that what what's being watched can you know, enable you to be able to really understand the character of somebody, like what they're really interested in. You know, sometimes you know some of the more shady areas of, of somebody's character, and also things like geolocation information. Ross, um, I'm assuming you're in agreement with that, that that is part of the issue here on TikTok. Um, as we're looking at it, though, in Europe, at least, do things like GDPR regulations, are they not designed to protect from that? Certain countries have laws that say you must have your servers in this country if you're going to service our marketplace. Is, is it not incumbent upon the United States and Europe to put in place laws like that rather than simply blame TikTok as a company? Well, they do in respect to GDPR, and, it, and depending on what device you're on. So if it's, if it's an Apple device, then Apple's very good at segregating that data and being a data custodian uh, and making sure that the apps aren't accessing areas that perhaps they shouldn't. Uh, perhaps on the Android, it's a, it's a little more open. But I think uh, the governments, their big concern is really just the sort of these massly addictive applications that run like wildfire in the population. If you take the US as an example, TikTok's got 150 million monthly users. That's between 40 and 45% of the population. So the broader concern is the influence of such apps. And we've already seen in AI that AI will bias towards a negative outcome to, to create a groundswell of activity, which then drives advertising revenue. So if you've got that amount of influence over a population and the AI goes wrong or somebody's influencing the programming, you've got the ability to massively influence the um, psyche of the actual whole country. And that's, that's the big concern here as well. Aina, thank you for joining us from Beijing today. Um, what's your position with regards to TikTok? Why do you think TikTok is the focus of this row right now? Well, quite frankly, just because it's China, um, you know, uh, this this argument that China could do something unless you're saying racially that Chinese are less trustworthy than other people uh, sounds uh, a bit dodgy to me. And quite frankly, um, TikTok is behind Facebook, Google, Meta and their Instagram. 
um, in terms of users on a monthly basis. They all engage in the same uh, activities. They, in fact, TikTok gathers less information than they do. So this is really just a geopolitical move, uh, you know, kind of reds under the bed, McCarthy-esque uh, uh, type of, you know, let's get people excited about something when, in fact, the real issues are the economy and what's happening in Europe. Uh, right now, you, you know, you have situations in France where people are burning cars in the streets day after day, or night after night, I should say, and yet people want to talk about TikTok which is used by 150 million monthly users in Europe. And some of them make money from it. So, so for you, is this- As I said, for just you, uh, is this, more the same. Is, for you, is this broadly Sinophobia then as the main concern behind it? Or do you see there as being, uh, if you like, more of a commercial interest here? Google and Facebook don't want another competitor on the block. What is your angle on where this is coming from? Well, I, no, I see it as mostly sinophobia. Uh, it, you know, obviously, um, from a competitive point of view, these other groups would uh, love to see, uh, you know, TikTok go away. Uh, but quite frankly, if they were implicated in any way in trying to lobby this, even on a soft side or something like that, uh, you could see some, um, you know, some real backlash, especially by the young users. I mean, you're talking about um, over 50 percent of all the users of TikTok are between 18 and 24. Uh, they're also the prime targets of Facebook, Google, Meta, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and they would not take it very nicely if they found out that these large behemoths were um, engaging in untoward activity, um, you know, basically uh, uh, commercial sabotage. Now, Gavin, I've got a clip here from a uh, Chinese state spokes, uh, spokeswoman. This is uh, Mao Ning, the spokeswoman for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So far, the U.S. government has not provided any evidence that TikTok poses a threat to U.S. national security. But it has repeatedly made the presumption of guilt against and unreasonably suppressed the relevant companies. We have also taken note that some members of the U.S. Congress call the attempt to ban TikTok xenophobic political persecution. The U.S. side should earnestly respect the market economy and the principle of fair competition, cease unreasonable suppression of foreign companies, and provide an open, fair, just and non-discriminatory environment for foreign companies to invest and operate in the US. Gavin, that is pretty strong language there coming out of the Chinese. Um, the Chinese state would look at this situation and say, well, look, you've got Google, you've got YouTube, you've got Facebook, you've got all of these different social media applications here in China operating. They've got a far bigger footprint in China than TikTok has in the US. What are you worried about? Um, so, uh, first off, I'm political, not technical, and you know, I I look at things from a uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, right? Um, you know, there's no xenophobic agenda or political agenda with any of the answers I give. Now, when it comes to um, to data, it, as I said, you know, previously, it's really around sovereignty and it's really around access. And I think what people are very concerned about is that um, people in China can be compelled to gather that data and leverage it in any way they want. So if you look at like Meta and Google, yeah, they, they gather loads and loads of data. I would argue that is actually a very bad thing as well. I'm on the side of uh, privacy for all. Um, but um, you know, unfortunately, with, uh, the Ch with the China element, under the national intelligence laws, uh, Article 7 and, and uh, 10, they, they can gather that data and, they can, and it can be leveraged against people. Now, yeah, I think that we have to be really careful here that we don't just focus on TikTok. I think we need to broaden it and look at all social media platforms when we when we worry about the risks associated with them. Like yeah, the 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 generation of today, the 18 to 24 year olds that you were talking about, you know, they are the business leaders and the operators of critical infrastructure in the future. You know, they're the they're going to be the politicians. They're going to be the leaders. And all the things they do today on those platforms could be leveraged against them in the future. And that, to me, is the biggest concern here. So you're worried about uh, potentially embarrassing or compromising information 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line. Is that a similar position for you, Ross? Well, I just want to come back to the comments in terms of the xenophobia side of it. And, and this is, 
a sort of a play against China as 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 a race. And I I think that yes, this has got some commercial elements to it. And, uh, and I think the Twitter and the Facebook and the Instagrams of this world, they might be right behind uh, TikTok. This is the thin end of the wedge. This is about governments being concerned. You mentioned, you know, President Macron standing at the parliament buildings, looking out the window and watching burning cars, thinking uh, this is uh, maybe social media is not helping here. So I think it's within the rights of any uh, organisation, whether it be government or commercial, to determine what their data security policy is as it relates to uh, private use of the device itself. Now, we got into this concept of bring your own device, which meant all the companies and governments didn't have to buy technology that the users could bring their own. Well, here's a consequence of that policy. Now the governments need to tighten this up and make sure this isn't just a, a security issue. It's not just a safety issue. It's not just an espionage. It's a productivity issue. Uh, these apps are consuming massive amounts of time of organisations that are paying those employees and they've got the right to, to ban them. China, as a country, uh, bans such technologies themselves. I mean, you can't use TikTok in China and, and China bans a lot of use of US-based social media technology. So I don't think we can get into this if this is people doing it against China. China's been playing this game for decades. Well, uh, you, ra you raise a point there about countries where uh, TikTok has had issues or has been banned. Now, we have a list of them here. In the UK, TikTok has been banned from government devices after a review found that there could be a leak to how data and information information is used by the app. The US, the White House has demanded that TikTok's Chinese owners, ByteDance, either sell up or face a ban. The European Union's brought in restrictions, India, Taiwan, Canada, even Afghanistan, but also, as you mentioned, Ross, in China as well. So, Aina, if China has brought in some restrictions on TikTok, is it not reasonable other people would bring in restrictions on TikTok as well? Yeah, I mean, if you read the rest of the government's uh, argument, um, they've said that it's up, it's it's a sovereign decision. Uh, the issue that they have is that there's no proof. Uh, you you expect fair play. Uh, China explained its security situation long ago. It did not allow. It does not allow Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook, etc. Uh, people do use it because they have VPNs and things like that. But technically, you're not supposed to. But the issue here is that China sees uh, companies like Huawei, uh, which are big Chinese companies who are leaders in their area, being routinely mowed down uh, by uh, you know politicians in an effort to, it seems, vilify and bring China down. Now, I'm, I, I appreciate uh, both experts talking about how you know. Uh, Chinese could be, um, you know, forced to do this. And of course, this isn't xenophobic or anything like that. But they forget to mention that the U.S. has on its books currently Section 702 of the FISA Code, which it says that legally the U.S. can go in and gather any force. All of these companies we're talking about, Facebook, Google, Meta, Instagram, even TikTok, force them to give them the information that they have gathered on foreign nationals. Well, what's so interesting about that is that other governments have similar uh, things, all in the name of security. So if I can't process your information, I'm America, and uh, you know I can't process my own people, well, I can send it to Great Britain or Canada. They can process it and then send me actionable intelligence. So you know, as Snowden uh, so aptly demonstrated or leaked, uh, it's clear that our governments are not playing with a uh, fair deck. Uh, the issue is, is, are the countries of the West who are always talking about, you know, defending the rule of law, you know, fair process, presumption of innocence, are they in fact just talking uh, out the sides of the mouth when it's, uh, it's convenient to criticize people but not necessarily follow itself? The presumption of innocence is something that is absolutely bedrock to, um, you know, Western culture. When you start ignoring it, um, in, in that case, you just lock up everybody, you know. Gavin, uh, Einar raises a very valid point there, the point of double standards. Here in uh, the United Kingdom, also in the United States, there have been lots of agreements. We can talk about Echelon as being one of them, Five Eyes as being another one, where data and security information is swapped around between various countries to get around domestic laws on listening to your own citizens. The British government can't listen on British uh, listening to British citizens, 
but it could perfectly happily get the government of New Zealand to do it on their behalf. For instance, these kinds of games are regularly played. So is this not a case of double standards with regards to TikTok? Well, first off, I 100% agree with Einar. Um, I think it is, there are double standards at play here. And you know, as you mentioned, 702 um, in the Pfizer Act, we've got Ripper here in the UK, you know, Prism in the US as well. So there, there are, you know, I, I think you know, one of the biggest issues is you know, citizens don't realize how much their data can be used against them and how much these companies are gathering their data. And so when it comes to like government devices, 100% they shouldn't be on uh, government devices. Like TikTok shouldn't be on any government device, right? Facebook shouldn't be on any government device. You know, uh, Twitter shouldn't be on any government device. You know, these devices should be locked down. They should be restricted for the use of what, what they're actually using the device for. When it comes to like cybersecurity strategy, you really have to think about not you know, whether somebody is doing something, but what happens if, the, if they can and the probability of them doing it. And like for me, I think the more you increase the overall attack surface of an individual and a nation by uh, installing you know, applications like this, installing uh, software that's not required, you, you are increasing that attack surface itself. Ross, um, related but subtly different issue here. Um, many small knickknacks around many houses in both Europe and North America are manufactured in China. It doesn't matter whether it's my son's remote controlled char uh, car, which comes not with a charger that I plug into the wall, but a USB charger that I plug into my computer. Uh, the similar thing happens with the Internet of Things and items from fridges across the television sets. A large amount of data that we would generally re regard as irrelevant. Obviously, people regard social security numbers, passport numbers, bank account details. Those are very high security, but it's the irrelevant data that is currently being hoovered up on large servers is this a security threat? Not now, but maybe 10 or 20 years down the road from now. Well, I think, Philip, you brought this back to the heart of the crux of what we're dealing with here. And this is a cybersecurity issue. And if you look at it, by the end of 2023, we're expecting a cost of cybersecurity to reach $8 trillion. And all governments now are implementing all manner of policies and regulations with respect to the European Union on Internet of Things. They have realized that all of these devices are being manufactured, not just in China, but anywhere, with a lack of security uh, controls around them. So now they're mandating those manufacturers have to start implementing cybersecurity. The SEC in the US is considering implementing regulations at the moment around uh, companies having to, having to mandatorily disclose breaches as part of their, their public statements uh, as far as their um, uh, shareholder meetings and things go. So, so what we're dealing with is a mass global problem of uh, breaches that are costing governments and uh, companies huge amounts of money. And so we, we have to step back from this and go, okay, if we talk about China for a second, I've been in cybersecurity for three decades now. And as far as I can see in most of the reports that I read and most of the incidents that I've been involved in, there is proof. And there's a long history of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea acting outside the bounds of normal operating procedure as it relates to being good global citizens and are using cybersecurity and criminal gangs to go after intellectual property, financial gain, and so forth. And so I think we have to recognize that and organizations need to look at their uh, technology stack, they need to look at their people, they need to look at training and making sure that they're aware of these factors and are um, protecting their organizations accordingly. I know, a few moments ago, I threw a quote from the uh, spokeswoman from the Chinese Foreign Ministry at my two guests in the studio. So now I'm gonna throw a uh, clip at you from the uh, Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster, Oliver Dowden here in the UK. I recently commissioned a review by our cybersecurity experts to assess the risks posed by certain third-party apps on government devices, and in particular, the installation and use of TikTok. And so today, we are strengthening the security of those devices in two key respects. First, we are moving to a system where government devices will only be able to access third-party apps that are on a pre-approved list. This system is already in place across many departments. Now it will be the rule across government. Second, we are also going to ban the use of TikTok on government devices. We will do so with immediate effect. So, Aina, 
that's, again, pretty strong language from the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. He has his reasons. He's in the government. Each government has their own, uh, you know, their sovereign nations. They can decide what they ha have on their employees' uh, handsets. And I agree with, the, uh, you know, the rest of the experts that these things do have to be watched. And they're, of course, watched in, in Russia, China, even Africa. I know a lot of ambassadors, they spend a lot of time uh, talking about all the needs for to make sure that their conversations are, in fact, private. That will go on. Uh, but this idea of spreading distrust, uh, that that is the basis of the world going forward, there's always a cat and mouse game that's going to go on between those who want to know your secrets and you know you trying to keep some sort of privacy. But the issue is not singling out uh, Russia and all the, quote, bad actors, as Ross was doing. Uh, that sounds a little disingenuous when we know for a fact that Cambridge Analytica was out there uh, helping with regime change in terms of money. Um, the U.S. government has been involved in regime changes or around the world uh, using cyber tools. You know, they, they think about it. U.S. has a $90 billion a year uh, spy budget. You know, the whole PLA has a $230 billion budget on a yearly basis. It kind of gives you an idea who has the upper hand here. I mean, it was the U.S. who was caught spying uh, by putting malware, you know, an open, open box onto hard drives made in the U.S., Seagate, et cetera. This is going back a few years, but I'm sure your experts will remember this. Um, it was the CIA who just thought it was great. Here there are these hard drives being produced in the U.S. We've put malware on them so we have an open book in. Um, but remember, this kind of distrust is going to have consequences. The footprint of what China has uh, in the U.S. is minuscule compared to what the U.S. has in China in terms of software. The U.S. has put up these barriers to the hardware side. We've seen that. They don't want uh, China to have chips or chip making of equipment. And now they're going after software. In this case, we might as well just, you know, draw up the drawbridges and, uh, you know, just keep the walls intact and live in fear about what could happen as opposed to having any proof that something has happened. If we look at TikTok, um, it has been made, it's a somewhat disingenuous offer, um, but it has been made the offer by the US government that they could spin off or sell off TikTok in the United States and they'd be fine and happy with that. Do you think that that's a reasonable solution or not? Well, I think it'll be the end solution, either that or the, the Chinese government objects to uh, some sort of intellectual property to do with the algorithm. They use a custom algorithm. They might object to that being used. I don't know. Uh, but from a commercial point of view, uh, it could be forced. But the question is, do you want um, you know, governments saying, well, if you want to be in my backyard, you have to sell off to my people? Uh, generally, there's this idea that in the West, uh, there's something called a free market, uh, that we're supposed to have a freedom of speech, and uh, that there's a freedom of choice. Um, obviously, that's not the case anymore, because as long as you yell China, you can get almost anything passed through Congress, as it seems to be the only issue that, that they can agree on, not the $31.5 trillion in debt or the debt bomb that they're facing, uh, et cetera, or the divisions. Just five and a half hours is talking about cat videos and what could happen if people learn that uh, you, you, know, you like to watch um, you know, pictures of penguins in your spare time. Well, let me bring in Gavin again. Gavin, um, if we look at this situation, is this not an own goal for politicians, whether in the United States or here in the European Union? TikTok overwhelmingly skews towards younger people. They've been complaining for decades now about youth participation in politics. This was their platform. They could use the algorithms to sort of track down who's likely to vote left, who's likely to vote right. They could target them directly. Is there not a problem for politicians if they get rid of TikTok? Uh, well, I'm not a political campaign manager, so I have no idea of uh, the ways that they, they influence. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica uh, example uh, given a few minutes ago is a really good example of how they do manipulate these algorithms. And, and sometimes get it wrong. Uh, uh, sometimes do get it wrong, yeah. Um, and uh, things end up voting the wrong way. So, um, yeah, I think that um, the like politicians, yeah, if they, yeah, if they were smart about it, um, you know, they, and, you know, they, they would 
figure out how to actually leverage these platforms for their for the greater for their greater good. Um, but I think that what, uh, what it will come down to is they want to leverage the platforms, but they don't want the the platforms to be able to be leveraged by other people outside of their borders. And you know, just to push back a little bit, you know, when it comes to data security, data sovereignty, like this has been a long-standing thing where you know, data should reside within the borders, and it's not it's not like it's suddenly changed. You know, you look at you know, in the EU as an example. You know, we have data residing in the EU because we don't trust the Americans with that data. You know, the, there's a big issue with with Microsoft a few years ago in Ireland. You know, we you know, we like to have the the data within our own region. And you know, TikTok, if they want to be successful, they should keep the data in uh, in the firewall it offered in the US. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the show today. But remember, you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Just head there and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye.